Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to go over some of the details of one of the absolute tragedies of the 20th century, which was, of course, the Holocaust, the uh, awful massacring uh, by the Nazi Germans of millions of Jews. I want to concentrate on one of the death camps, which is called uh, Chelmno. This was in uh, Poland and is one of the most brutal of all the uh, the death camps. The source I'm using is called Chelno and the Holocaust, the history of Hitler's first death camp. The author is Patrick Montague. Uh, and I'm going to pull up my screen here so you can follow along the text of this. Um, so um, I'm going to start by looking at one of the witness testimonies uh, by a chap called Michael uh, Podchelmbrunik. Not very good at the old Polish pronunciations, but um, he gave a, a testimony um, at the Nuremberg uh, trials um, of his time at the Chelmno camp. He was one of only a couple of uh, survivors um, who, who made it out alive. Uh, and he's talking about the period that he was there in January 1942 and um, I'm just going to skip to where he talks about the method of execution that was used at Chalmno which uh, not a lot of people uh, may know uh, they actually didn't use the um, the gas chambers there they used gas vans you can uh, I've put a picture of one of these gas vans here and uh, I will just uh, read out the te testimony of, uh, of how all of this worked. Um, so it says, uh, I'll just start here. Um, it was said at that time the area was not guarded at night. When I worked there, the, the length of the ditch grave was between 10 and 20 meters. During the course of the day, about 1,000 people were buried. This amount of corpses took up to three or four meters of the length of the ditch. The van in which people were gas could carry 80 to 90 people at a time. During my stay in Chalmno, two vans were used simultaneously. Besides these, there was a third larger van, which was broken and parked in the courtyard of the mansion in Chalmno. I saw that a wheel had been removed. Every day, 12 to 13 van loads arrived to the forest. In this way, I figured that around 1,000 people a day were gassed. Uh, and if you can imagine, uh, I'm going to show this uh, van again. 90 people were kind of uh, packed into this van, and then they put uh, carbon monoxide in there. Uh, and of course, everybody would die inside the van. Uh, the Jews who took the corpses out of the van also had the task of removing the wooden floor grating and cleaning the van thoroughly. Valuables found inside the van were also placed in the suitcase. The towels and soap were separated and taken back every day. That day, which was a Tuesday, the bodies of my wife and my two children, a seven-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl, were thrown out of the third van load that arrived in the Chelno forest. I lay down next to the body of my wife. I wanted them to shoot me. An SS man approached me and said, this big guy can still work hard. He whipped me three times, forcing me to return to work. At noon, we were given something to eat. We had to get out of the ditch without the shovels and form a circle. The SS men also formed a circle around us. We were given black coffee and food that had been brought by the Jews in their bundles. Generally, we were well fed. That evening, uh, Krewaki from Klawada, from Klodawa, I don't remember his first name, and one other Jew, whose name I don't remember, hung themselves in the basement. I also intended to hang myself, but I was persuaded not to. Okay, so uh, there you can see his general description there of the process. They, they put these people in the vans, um, in the daytime, they had uh, already dug these uh, mass graves. Uh, they were they were gassed in the chamber, and then, um, uh, you know, the 
the uh, bodies were put into the mass graves and it was uh, the job of a number of these uh, uh, guys they had working in the death camp to clean the uh, grating in the wooden floor of the van and then retrieve the towels and the soap that they were given and then take those back for the next load okay um so then um i'm going to kind of move on a little bit because these mass graves that they uh were digging were causing a bit of a problem uh let me just read on numerous graves were dug in the forest witnesses relate that they saw at that time guards who served in the forest do not provide a comprehensive overview of the number of these graves or the insight into the processes of deciding their locations. As Viner and Prodeljibic relate, the graves were dug by hand using pickaxes and shovels, a feat made even more difficult by the sub-zero weather conditions. Later in the spring, Bothman brought in machinery to dig the pits and cover them over, a fact mentioned by the forester Heinz May when he visited the forest together with Bothman. So if you can imagine, it was the winter, it was freezing cold, but somehow they managed to, to, to dig these mass graves uh, and they stuck all the bodies in there. Following the escapes of Viner and uh, our, our speaker here, whose name I find it very difficult to say, uh, while on the way to work in the forest, at least two changes were made in regard to the Jewish labor squads. All Jews working in Chelno were soon shackled in leg irons, which made walking difficult and escape all but impossible. The Jewish labor detail working in the forest was henceforth transported to and from the graves in a gas van. Both changes greatly diminished any chances for others to escape, so there were no other survivors, basically. The situation for the Jewish workers in Chelmno was a living hell. Incredibly, for those men left working in the forest, their situation was about to get even worse. According to the German forester Heinz May, an order was issued that sometime in the spring to camouflage the graves in the forest, uh, you know, some steps needed to be taken. Trees were to be planted on top of the graves and a fence was to be built around the forest camp to provide greater security. Such an order, or at least part of it, soon became impossible to carry out. The corpses buried in the ground for several months began decomposing. So if you can imagine, it was getting hotter and those corpses were starting to rot underneath. The mounds of earth that covered the graves began to swell and the whole area was engulfed in a wretched stench. The problem of decomposing corpses was so acute that all transports to Chelno were stopped. The last known transport with 630 Jews arrived from uh, this place here on June the 11th. May was a witness to uh, a, a Dante-esque scene when he visited the forest camp during this time. This is a direct testimony uh, from this person. He says, uh, when during the summer of 1942, during the erection of the post fence, I again, together with Bothman, saw the graves. There was a nauseating, sweet, strong odour above the whole place. I had to hold my nose and left the place as quickly as possible. Bothman showed me great round bulges which had uh, developed on the long graves. If one looked closely, one could see mist rise in the sunshine. Bothman told me that 250,000 corpses were buried there. However, there was still room for at least 100,000 more. To solve the problem, the notorious standard Führer Paul Blobel soon arrived in Chelmno. Blobel's connection to Chelmno dated back a year earlier to June the 22nd, 1941, when the German army launched Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. Blobel commanded Eisatzkommando 4A, one of the mobile killing units that followed the German army into the Soviet Union. These groups of executioners fanned out across the occupied territory with orders to kill, among others, the Nazi arch enemies, communist activists, and of course, Jews. 
Perhaps the most notorious of these operations was the murder of more than 30,000 uh, Jews in Kiev, uh, Babi Yar, during the two-day period in late September 1941. The victims were shot and buried in pits. Early counter-offences by Russians led to the discovery of mass graves, and accounts of the atrocities began appearing in the press. As a result, Himmler ordered the eradication of the graves throughout the region. The top-secret operation tasked to Blobel was codenamed Action 1005. Blobel required a location to experiment and develop a method to employ throughout the East, and Chelmno proved ideal. It was far from the front and therefore secure, and the site offered an abundance of material to work with. Bothman also needed Blobel to solve his immediate problem of the decomposing corpses, as well as the longer-term issue of erasing evidence of the mass murder in the forest. One of Blobel's experiments involved blowing up the bodies with thermite bombs. This proved unsuccessful as body parts were left hanging from the tree limbs. During these trials, a part of the forest caught fire and the Colo Fire Department arrived on the scene but was not allowed to enter the restricted area. The Jewish Wald Commando eventually extinguished the fire. Blobel ultimately decided that the best course of action for Bothman's problem was simply to dig up the corpses and burn them in specially built crematoria. In order to burn thousands of bodies already in the forest, huge quantities of wood were needed. Bothman went to see the forester, May, who gave the following account. So this is again this forester, May. He says, one day Bothman appeared in the forestry office and told me that he had orders from higher authority to burn all the corpses. He had already uh, he already had the graves opened and attempted to burn the bodies with thermite bombs. Now he wished to try to carry out the order with firewood, and he requested great amounts of it. During the burning with thermite bombs, a forest fire had been caused, whereby a portion of the wood surrounding the field of graves burned down. The charred woods would not be cut down, since otherwise a view of the field of graves would have become possible to see from the road. I approached the Landers format stat in regard to the ordered firewood, and I was advised to deliver the wood. At first, I ordered all young woods in question to be searched and delivered great quantities of branches and faggots. However, this was not sufficient, and I had to deliver cordwood. Finally, the consumption became so great that I changed over to make clearings in older woods. For many months, a terrible stench laid over the entire vicinity. When the wind was blowing from the west, the sickening odour could be noticed up to the forestry house in Belize. This was about 15 kilometres from the graves by air. After several experiments, the cremation of the bodies took place in a circular hole in the earth, about three metres deep, with a diameter of four metres. It was lined around with stones. A strong fire was built in the hole, and the bodies were simply thrown in. This hole in the earth is apparently a description of one of the field furnaces constructed by Blobel. At least four such crematoria were built, measuring roughly eight metres by eight metres. Testimonies indicate experiments using these furnaces in operation in the middle of July. Frederick Mederholtz, a guard transferred to the forest camp in August, described the crematorium he saw in operation at that time as being approximately eight metres long, eight metres wide, made of stones and buried deep in the ground. According to the guard Wildermuth, who served in the forest camp, these ovens did not work very well. It is assumed that the solution to eliminate the danger posed by the thousands of decomposing stinking corpses with the field furnaces was inadequate, and therefore two more efficient crematoria were built. These ovens were much more elaborately constructed and featured tall chimneys towered over the forest. Local residents could see the chimneys and the smoke belching from them. One brief description of the new, more efficient crematoria, albeit secondhand, comes from Ros Ro Rosalia Peham, the wife of one of the guards. 
two crematoria were built. I don't know how they were installed because, of course, I was never there. I know only that the ovens had tall chimneys and were so constructed that they had a very strong draft. The bodies were arranged in layers in these ovens. Between each layer of bodies was a layer of wood. Gasoline was poured over the pile of bodies and wood when the corpses were burned in the fire. The guard Mederholt stated that later in the autumn, another furnace was built and put into service. Hatschufura Fritz Ismar, who was in charge of the valuables for the Sonder Commando and who was transferred to the forest camp by Bothman in the fall because transports were no longer arriving, confirms that another furnace was indeed built. When I began to serve in the forest, one crematorium was being used. There were two more of them, and they were not used anymore. Although the testimonies are limited, it generally appears that a number of temporary furnaces were constructed by Blobel and tested over a period of time. Hapchachfura, Johannes Rung, Lentz's assistant, subsequently carried out the construction of the new ovens. He acquired 60,000 bricks from the firm Frudenreich in Kolo. His superiors were apparently pleased with his work. According to one of the guards, he received the War Service Cross for building the ovens. To me, it's quite remarkable how in the middle of World War II, all of this was going on. Uh, you know, he saw 60,000 bricks in the middle of a world war. Quite remarkable. These two furnaces were built following the visit of Rudolf Hess, um, Hoss, not Hess, Hoss, the commandant of Auschwitz to the camp. Heinrich Himmler had inspected the Auschwitz concentration camp in the summer of 1942, observing the entire extermination process. Uh, Standenfuhrer Blobel arrived in Auschwitz shortly afterwards, informing Hoss that the mass graves were to be opened and the bodies cremated. The ashes were to be uh, disposed of so that in the future it would be impossible to calculate the number of victims. Blobel was to show Hoss how this was being carried out in Chelmno. The visit took place in September 16th, 1942. Hoss was not impressed with the technology Bothman had inherited from Lang. Later recalling, during my visit to in Kulmhof, I saw the extermination installations with the gas fans, which were prepared for killing by exhaust fumes. The chief of the uh, command would describe this method as very unreliable because the gas was produced very irregularly and often was not enough for killing. Okay. Um, but we know that there were only two survivors. So it must have been quite, it must have been quite effective for there only to be of two survivors from the, from the camp. Um, once the crematoria were ready, the unimaginable and nauseating task of exhuming the mass graves began. The corpses were dug out of the graves by the Jewish Vald commando, the size which was increased for this purpose. The corpses were then transported to the crematoria by the Jewish workers using specially constructed wooden stretchers as well as a small tram that ran from the graves to the crematoria. Blobel was not satisfied with simply burning the corpses. All traces were to be destroyed. After the corpses were burned, small bone fragments remained. These two had to be disposed of. It was decided to crush the bone fragments into powder. A bone grinder was required from this purpose. Blobel turns to Hans Bebo of the Ghetto Verwaltung in Lotz for help. On July the 16th, 1942, Bebo's assistant, the deputy chief of the Ghetto Verwaltung, uh, Friedrich Ribber, wrote a letter to the head of the Council of Elders, Chaim Rumkowski, in the Lotz Ghetto. And he says to the elders of the Jews, Regarding the machines in the ghetto, I request an immediate assessment of whether inside the ghetto there is a bone mill, either manually operated or motor driven, by order of Ribba, Sonder Commando Kampf is interested in such a mill. Apparently there was no bone mill in the ghetto at this time, 
as one was eventually brought from the Hanover firm of Schreiber and Company. On Blobel's order, Walter Burmeister assisted in bringing the bone mill and a compressor to the forest camp. The mill weighed about five and a half tons and was transported on a five ton truck and trailer. The grinder was powered by a gas driven generator. According to one of the guards, uh, Haptachmeister Gustav Fielder and Riva Roba Wachtmeister Kurt Hoffman supervised the operation of the bone grinder. And uh, if you uh, are finding this a little bit difficult to believe, thankfully, there is a picture of this contraption uh, from the Holocaust Encyclopedia, the United States Holocaust uh, Museum here. This is the, uh, it's not the one from Chelmo, it's from Janowska, the bone crushing machine used there. So as you can see, this is the terrible contraption uh, that they used. Um, I'll just read the description of how this was used. I hear that there was a bone grinder in the forest camp where the bone fragments from the crematoria were ground. One night, when I was standing sentry in the forest camp, I had a closer look. It was situated not far from the crematoria and was covered with a roof. There was a large funnel on top where the bone fragments must have been poured in. And there were several bags full of ground up bones near the mill. The bags were open so I could see what was inside. Heinz May, the forester, also saw the bone grinder while on one of his visits to the forest camp. The hollow cylindrical bones, which were not burnt, were taken out and pulverized in a bone mill by a driven motor which was located in an especially built wooden barrack. I don't know where they took this bone flour. There must have been great quantities. Bothman showed me the bone meal. There were a number of filled sacks in the barracks. Bothman said to one of the chained men employed there, Easy, get me a handful of flour from the sack. The elderly man hurried to a sack and bought two handfuls of snow white, finely ground bone flour. Bothman said to him, These are members of your race. The man said quietly and submissively, Well, what can we do? I could tell from his voice too that he was a German. The sounds of machinery emanating from the forest camp could be heard by the people who lived nearby. Initially, the ashes and ground bones were simply buried in pits four meters deep uh, and eight to ten meters wide. Later, they were sprinkled around the area on the forest floor. A post-war investigation noted where the cremains had been sprinkled. The vegetation was very abundant and of a more intense green colour than the surrounding area. The guard, Jakob Wildermouth, adds that the bone meal was put into sacks and transported away from time to time. He did not know where it was taken, but heard that it was used as fertilizer. So that is how they, how there were no mass graves in the area because they used this uh, awful bone grinding device. Now, um, as, as grisly and as horrible as these awful details are, one truly one of the atrocities of the 20th century, uh, I thought I uh, kind of produced this map um, to visualize exactly what the plan was there at Chelmno, as, as you saw from the description, much of this was not planned ahead of time, but were kind of ad hoc. You know, they were kind of making it up as they went along. So uh, the, the the camp commander, that is, you know, the problem of the mass graves, um, you know, the bodies decomposing, causing a smell. Then he wanted to get rid of it. And then he wanted to get rid of the evidence that had happened altogether on the orders of Himmler, if you recall, in the middle of the summer there. So just if we just go down this flow chart, the victim is transported to the death camp at Chelmno. Uh, he's given a soap and towel, packed into a van with 89 other victims. The soap and the towels are retrieved so that the whole process can start again. The body is put into a uh, mass grave. In That was in the winter time. The bodies were put there. But then by the time of the summer, late spring, summer sort of time, uh, they'd started to smell, so they were dug up. First of all, they tried bombing them with thermite. 
that didn't work. Then, if you recall, they did try making a kind of makeshift ground furnace. That didn't work. So then they constructed a 6,000 brick oven and cremated the remains. But apparently that didn't get rid of all of it. So the remains, you know, any bits of bone and whatnot that were left over was fed into the bone grinder that I showed you earlier on and um, uh, turned into bone meal. So, you know, really quite quite kind of ghastly uh, details there. Um, and I just think that it's important to be reminded uh, sometimes of the horrors of the uh, 20th century. You know, people talk about uh, genocide quite a lot, but it's good to remind ourselves sometimes um, to never forget what actual genocide looked like. Um, sorry, you know, to to make such a depressing video. Um, I'll be back later on with a special stream, as I mentioned. Um, I'll just ask people again. Um, my courses are available. Trivia at the Academic Agency. But most importantly of all, ladies and gentlemen, get out. <laughs>